Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. You're very welcome to our service of morning prayer. Uh, what a beautiful morning it is uh, to come together as God's people and to offer Him our praise and our worship uh, from our hearts. Uh, just a couple of wee announcements to remind you. Uh, I think the bag totals up to about 30 now, so it's growing. The pile's getting bigger. Thank you so much, everyone who has donated uh, clothes and shoes. Uh, soon we'll be able to get in touch with a guy, and he'll come and pick them up. Thank you very much. Uh, a big thanks to those who cut the grass. Uh, it looks fantastic. I've given out uh, sheets uh, to what we think are the team leaders. If you would like to join uh, and help out, just let somebody know or let me know, and we'll slot you in. Uh, I'll leave it to the team leaders to liaise with George or Ivan regarding what week they're on. If they want to switch around, that's fine. No problem. Good. Uh, oh, just one other announcement I have. Uh, I've kept the sheets up here. I've got a wee puzzle sheet. I want as many people as possible to take one. Uh, it's just like a word, a word search. But what I want you to promise me to do is when you get it, to fold it over and don't look at it till you get home. Okay? So take it home like this here. And then when you get home, when you get a few minutes, I want you to look at the time and jot the time down on the page, do the crossword, and then look at the time again. Bring it in next week with your name on it, and the person with the quickest time will get a wee prize. Okay, so that's two sheets back and front. Jot down the time, and when you finish it, jot down the time again. No cheating. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it to your, to your good Christian character not to cheat. So don't look at it. Write the time down. Don't take anything off it for a cup of tea or anything like that there. Don't take time off it. Start and finish it. Write the time down, and the best time will get a prize, okay? So put your, if you want to put your age on, so if the younger ones might be, uh, well, if you're, if you're of a certain age, don't put your age, but if you're young, put your age down, because uh, the children will obviously get a, wee, a different prize, okay? So I think that's it. Good. The Lord be with you. Our text for today is Acts 2.37. Uh, Peter has just been preaching to the people, and we're told a very interesting thing. We're told that they were pricked in their hearts. And we want to look and see what that means. What does it mean to be pricked in your heart? And have you been pricked in your heart? And uh, we'll see, is it necessary to be pricked in your heart? And what does it really mean? Uh, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brothers, and it goes on to say, what shall we do to be saved? Beloved in Christ, we have come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving. We have come to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear His holy word proclaimed, to bring before Him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of His Spirit we may serve Him and know the greatness of His love. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sin, Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Please be seated for our first reading from Isaiah, chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of His robe filled the temple. Service were in attendance above Him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. 
And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the servants flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt is departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Our appointed psalm for today is Psalm 29. We'll remain seated for this psalm. Ascribe to the Lord, you powers of heaven. Ascribe to the Lord the honour due to his name. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is mighty in operation. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf. The voice of the Lord splits the flash of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. The Lord sits enthroned above the water flood. The Lord shall give strength to his people. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Geraldine is going to bring to us our reading from John chapter 3. Now a certain man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? Jesus answered, I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must all be born from above. The wind blows wherever it will, and you hear the sound it makes, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus replied, How can these things be? Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? I tell you the solemn truth. We speak about what we know, and testify about what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you people about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
For this is the way that God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Anne is back, as you noticed on our uh, organ this morning, to stand and sing. Uh, you can keep your mask on, apparently, and sing through it. And uh, Anne is going to play for it. So we're, st- we're delighted, Anne, to have you back playing again for us. So uh, let's raise the roof if we can. Let's just remain standing as we have a few moments of prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we come and sit under Your Word. And we know, Lord God, that doing so, we have a really powerful means to be taught, because we're not only listening to words from a preacher, 
We're listening to the promptings and guidings of the Holy Spirit. So help us, we pray, Lord God, in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Please be seated. I have to say a welcome to those who view on uh, the internet as well. Uh, you're very uh, pleased to have you with us join uh, in this service. I wonder, does anybody know what acomophobia is a fear of? Acomophobia is a fear of what? Pardon? Anybody know what that's a fear of? Big words? <laughs> a fear of pronouncing big words? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Does anybody know maybe the right pronunciation? That'll help, maybe. Ac acmophobia? Anybody, any idea what it is? Anybody work on the health service? No? Well, I'm sure you'll understand what it is when I show you the next slide. I'm sure maybe you've often cringed about this yourself. It's a fear of needles or sharp objects. Anybody got that fear? Anybody got a fear of needles? Yes, one or two. Yes. Um, I must confess now, I'm no big fan of needles myself. Uh, and a lot depends on who the nurse is, I've got to say. And uh, some nurses are very, very good. I went for a vaccine a few weeks ago, and the girl had it vaccinated me, vaccinated before I even knew it. She was absolutely brilliant. So uh, a fear of needles. Anybody heard the expression, cut to the heart or cut to the bone? Has anybody ever been cut to the bone here? <laughs> well, I confess I've been cut to the bone a few times. Uh, Maybe silly things I've done, uh, mistakes I've made, and somebody has said, listen, I want to have a word with you. And they pointed out the error of my ways, and I was cut to the bone. I was ashamed. Uh, I was sort of, uh, that expression, cut to the bone, it uh, sort of, it really gets to the heart of things, doesn't it? When somebody says something to you, maybe they made some comment. And maybe in truth, it hasn't been that long for some of you when you were cut to the bone. And sometimes it's people that we love the most, maybe our family or friends, that do it to us. They cut us to the bone and bring us down. And it's definitely not a nice experience being cut to the bone. In our reading from God's Word, in Acts 2.37, uh, Luke records these words. When they heard this, that is Peter, Peter's sermon. Peter had been preaching a, a long sermon, and we're told that the people that were listening were pricked in their heart, or another version has it, they were cut to the bone. They were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? What Peter is speaking about here is not an injection. It's not someone who put a needle into their heart and touched them. And he's not speaking here about maybe an insult that someone gave them or some comment that was told to them that really made them feel ashamed. But what Peter is speaking, or Luke is speaking about here is that there was something about Peter's sermon. There was something about the words he used. But more than that, the Holy Spirit, we're told, came upon them, and they were cut to the heart. They were pricked in the heart. And that's what was going on here in Luke chapter 2. We see several things about what it means, being pricked in the heart or cut to the heart. Luke says it was a supernatural act. The Spirit of God came upon them. And Whatever Peter said, the Holy Spirit applied it to them, each one of them. You know how sometimes when you're listening to a sermon, maybe, or maybe you're watching something on TV and you say, you know what, I can identify with that. Maybe you hear a story and you say, yes, I, I understand how that person feels. I can identify with them. I know what they've gone through. 
And it's a bit like that when the Spirit of God came upon these people. Peter preached to them. We'll look about that in a little while, what he actually said. But when Peter preached to them, the Holy Spirit came to them and reminded each of them, this applies to you. And we're told that the people felt it right at the center of their being. Whatever was said, they took ownership of it, and they said, this is me. This is talking about me. It's a supernatural act. The Holy Spirit was moving. We've been thinking about uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and today is Trinity Sunday. And I thought, how best can I explain to you what the Spirit of God does? And here's a wonderful example. This happens just after Pentecost, and the Spirit of God has been poured out. And we're told one of the effects, or one of the things the Spirit of God does, it, it makes people's heart open and pricks people to the heart, speaks into their very situation. And that's what was going on here. The Spirit of God bruised their heart or pricked their heart. And I wonder, when was the last time your heart was pricked by the Spirit of God? We see it's a supernatural act, but we also see that it's, a, it's an act that transforms people. The people were pricked in their heart, and then something happened. They said to Peter, we want to change. It's as if Peter had said, this is what you're like. And the people said, well, how can we change? And the Spirit of God was, was working, you see, and active in their lives, made them aware of something, and they said, well, how can we change? How can we change our behavior? How can we change what we have done? The Spirit of God was moving in their lives. Well, what caused them? What caused their hearts to be pricked? It seemed as if Peter was preaching to them about Jesus, and he was telling the people that Jesus had come, sent from God, and lived among them for a while, and then he was taken. He was arrested, he was led captive, he was tried, and he was put on a cross and crucified. And Peter turns around and says, listen, it is you that have done this. Uh, my siblings take it in turn now to look after mum, so we've got a, a rota during the week when we uh, are supposed to turn up and look after mum for a while. And each of my brothers and sisters take it in their turn uh, to, to do a, a day during the week. But my sister made it very clear to me that uh, when we're looking after mum, we're responsible. So I felt a bit of pressure then. If mum falls, it's my fault. So we have to keep an eye on mum. So there's sort of a, a responsibility or sort of a, a, an onus on us then to look after mum when we're there. And what this verse is telling us here is that when Peter preached, the people felt guilty about something they had done. And Peter was picking no bones about it and said, listen, you're responsible for the death of Jesus. You took him and crucified him, nailed him to a tree. But that's not the end of the story, of course. The third day he rose again. But Peter is laying it out for them. Listen, you people are responsible for the death of Jesus. And that's an awful burden, isn't it? to feel that you're responsible for the death of someone else. But that's what Peter was doing. He laid it out with a thick trial and said, you put Jesus to death. By your sins, by your transgressions, you're guilty. And the people felt guilty. And that's why they cried out, what must we do to escape then? And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and, and speaks to us, he, he says, well, listen, actually, we're guilty as well. We're just as much guilty of putting Jesus on the cross as those early Jews were, because we have transgressed, we have sinned. And by our transgressions, Jesus died on the cross. 
And that's what the Spirit of God does. He comes and makes us feel guilty about that and makes us own up to say, well, yes, actually, I have done bad things. I have done wrong things. I am guilty of that. And the Spirit of God wants to come and prick our conscience, prick our heart, wants us to own up to the wrong things we have done. And that's what Peter was preaching about. He says, this Jesus whom you crucified, whom you put to death, someone who had no sin became sin for you. And that's why Jesus died, he says. And then the people cry out, well, okay, Peter, we're guilty. We, we acknowledge that. What must we do then? And Peter goes on to say, of course, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Ask God for forgiveness. Turn away from your sin. You see what the Spirit of God does in, in pricking our hearts? It lays us bare. I think I've asked you this before, but I don't think anybody put their hand up and said they'd been in court. Well, I was in court a long time ago, and uh, it's not a nice feeling. But if you've been in court accused of something, and uh, the judge will ask you, are you guilty or not guilty? And maybe your lawyer or barrister or whoever's representing you, they'll say well, if you're guilty or not guilty. But the Holy Spirit comes and He says to us, listen, you are guilty. That's what, it, what He does when He pricks our hearts. He says, listen, you're guilty of wrongdoing. And we have to say, okay, I am guilty. We own up to it and say, yes, I have sinned against God. But the Holy Spirit doesn't stop there. The Holy Spirit wants to point out to us that we've done wrong, but also wants to lead us to forgiveness and redemption. And the people who were sitting under Peter's sermon said, well, okay, Peter, we, 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 we admit to it. We have, we have done wrong things in our lives, but what must we do to make it right? And then Peter goes on to say, well, that's the wonderful news about the gospel. Uh, somebody was asking me recently, uh, when am I going for an operation on my hip? And I said, well, it'll probably be 10 years down the line. Who knows when that list will come through? I might not need it. I don't know yet. But if you've been for an operation, it's, 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 a, it's a tougher deal. And I was just thinking of Geraldine who went through a heart operation a, a few years ago, a big, big operation. But it, it was necessary. It was absolutely crucial that you went through that, Geraldine, and if you've been for an operation, the doctors wouldn't put you through it if you didn't need it. You had to be, uh, go under surgery so that the problem would be fixed. And so it is here with being pricked in our heart. We need to be pricked in our heart that we can be made well again. And the way in which we're made well is through listening to God's Word and obeying God's Word. Peter preached the Word and said, listen, this is how you can be right. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and it'll be made right. I talk to some people who have been for operations, for hip operations or knee operations. We know Anne has gone through a knee operation, and they make a great recovery. And so it is with being spoken to by the Holy Spirit. When God's Spirit speaks to us and challenges us and convicts us, it's not that we live the rest of our lives feeling guilty and shamed and remorseful. We come to Him and say, yes, God, I confess to you I have sinned against you. But then we're told the Holy Spirit comes again and gives us forgiveness and gives us cleansing, gives us that feeling that all is well. So yes, He brings us down, makes us aware of what we have done wrong, that we're guilty. But along with that, once we, when we turn to Him, the Spirit comes and gives us joy in our hearts. I wonder, how, do you know something of this? what it is to be pricked in your heart by the Spirit of God, to be changed, to be transformed, and to have joy in your heart. And this is something of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. I've been thinking about that for a wee while. And, and uh, here in Acts, 
Luke gives us this wonderful example of what the Spirit of God does. Changes us, makes us new creatures, makes us new people, gives us new desires. These people who came to hear uh, Peter for that big sermon in Acts 2, they came with maybe all sorts of ideas in their head, but they left that day changed people. Over 3,000 were added to the church, we're told, because the Spirit of God came, spoke into their lives, and transformed them, made them new creatures. I wonder today, do we know something of what it is to be a new creature, to have our hearts pricked and changed and transformed, and now we are new creations, new desires, a new love for God, a new love for Jesus, a new love for the Holy Spirit, that we would serve Him all our days. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the way in which the Holy Spirit works, that sometimes and very often this is true, He has to come and lay us bare, open our hearts, wound us even, that we might see our need of grace and mercy. And having seen our need of grace and mercy, when we call out, we receive healing, we receive restoration, transformation, made anew. We thank You, Lord God, that this is what it is to be a follower of You, someone who has been made low and then lifted high, and their hearts are changed. We have hearts now that want to worship You, hearts that want to praise You, hearts that want to serve You. We're told that these early disciples went out with the great news and told others what God had done for them. We pray, Lord, that that will be our experience, that we will go out sharing what God has done for us through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to stand again and sing uh, this wonderful hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Let's remain standing as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And the collect for today. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all adversities. For you live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. We have a few moments now of prayer for people that we know, maybe someone in hospital. We think of those who are very sick at home. We think in particular of Patricia and Betty at this time. We pray, gracious God, your hand of healing, your hand of restoration, your hand of consolation, your hand of comfort. We're mindful, Lord, of others who are in hospital, of those who may be waiting to go into hospital for an operation or for treatment. We're very conscious, Lord, of that very long list of people who are needing health care and needing hospital care. We pray, gracious God, for those who are in homes, those who are near and dear to us. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick at home and being cared for at home. We pray for those carers, family members, neighbors, and friends who pitch in to help. We pray, gracious God, that you would be with all who need others at this time. We pray too, Lord God, for those who need help but maybe don't acknowledge it, who need care but feel that care is not for them. We pray, Lord God, that you would just be with them and be with their family members who would seek to live with them and help them. And our great God, we thank you for our schools. We thank you for our young people. We thank you, Lord God, that they're open, and we thank you that the kids are back to some sort of normality. We look forward to our Sunday school prize giving on in July, sorry, in June, and we pray that many children will come out for that day. And we look forward to the day when our Sunday school will be open again. We pray, Lord God, for those in government, for those who would make decisions that affect our lives. 
We pray for other governments of the world who make decisions that affect so many people in their countries. We think of countries, Lord God, where there is much want, where there's much fear and many deaths. We cannot help but think of India at the moment, and we think of the COVID-19 pandemic that is claiming so many lives. We think of other countries of the world, too, that is affected. We pray, gracious God, that You would help those countries that can do something that has got extra vaccines and extra money to help those countries in need. Lord, we pray for the spread of Your Word throughout the world. We think of those missionaries who have gone to different parts of this amazing world. We pray that You will be with them today, whatever country they are in, whatever nationality they are. We pray, gracious God, that You would bless the preaching and teaching of Your Word. We pray, Lord God, that it would be strengthened and comforted and accompanied by the work of the Holy Spirit, that many souls will be pricked in their hearts and come to a living faith. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for one another here, for the person beside us or in front of us or behind us. We thank You, Lord God, that we are part of Your family here. And we pray, Lord God, that You will encourage us, that You will strengthen us up together. Let's have a few moments now of quietness before God when we can bring someone or some situation before Him, knowing that we come to a God who is able and willing to do incredible things. Heavenly Father, thank You that You are the God of the impossible. When situations seem dark, You bring light. When things seem impossible, You make it possible. We pray, Lord God, that You would increase our faith, that You would help us to see a clear path in front of us. And this we ask through Jesus Christ. Amen. And we join together in the Collect for Morning Prayer. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that Your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us, that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget Your presence, but may remember that we're always walking in Your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our final hymn this morning is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen.